Um, now let's try and move on to the next speaker. So if you can stop sharing your slides. Yep. And Hyung Hoon, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Okay, that looks good. Uh, okay, so this talk is by Hyung Hyun Cho, um, who will be talking about an application of multi-party computation to biomedical data sharing. Off you go. All right, hi everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, virtually. Uh, first off, I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to speak. Um, for those of you who don't know, Broad Institute is a uh, genomics and biomedical research center at MIT and Harvard, where I started last year as a fellow to start a new group focusing on solving biomedical data privacy problems. So in recent years, there's been an explosion of large scale biomedical data sets around the globe, uh, thanks to rapid advances and high throughput experimental technologies. These data sets are often scattered across isolated silos, as the previous speaker has mentioned, um, in different labs, companies, and biobanks. And these are often difficult to access for research due to regulations and policies related to data privacy concerns. So the goal of our work is to leverage tools from modern cryptography, in particular multi-party computation, which is what I'll focus on in this talk, to overcome this barrier and enable secure sharing of these biomedical data. And the hope is that by doing so, we'll be able to enable new scientific discoveries with access to data whose scale far exceeds what individual entities can achieve. So in this talk, I will tell you about two of my recent papers on using NPC for uh, data sharing pipelines and biomedical research. And these will cover two different domains, uh, population genetics and pharmacological machine learning. And as I will explain, both of these uh, directions pose um, new unique challenges that we overcome with new computational techniques. So let me first start with the genetics example. So many of you have probably seen a figure like this in a different context before. So it's showing that the number of sequenced human genomes has been increasing at an exponential rate in the past couple of decades. Uh, now we're at about around 500,000 genomes. And this is projected to reach more than 10 million genomes in the next few years. So this is great news in that now we have a lot of genetic sequences out there that we could leverage to gain a better understanding into human genetics. But the bad news is that a lot of this data lies outside the reach of researchers. So first, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of this, um, are, a lot of these data are stored in isolated silos that are difficult to pull together. And even in cases where we do have access to centralized repositories, these are often put under strict and time consuming access review procedures that slow down the rate of research. So what we envision is a new computational platform where individuals and institutions can contribute their private genomic data uh, to scientific studies in a secure manner with the assurance that their data will remain private throughout uh, the process. So what could we achieve if we had a platform like this? Um, one thing we can do is to look at natural variation in the genome across different individuals. So this includes looking at things like single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, which refer to single letter differences uh, between different individuals' genomes. And the idea is to collect this information from a large population of individuals to try to understand how these genetic differences lead to differences in different human conditions. And just to define the key vocabulary here, uh, these elements that differ between individuals in the genome are called genetic variants. So SNP is one type of genetic variant. And the set, the set of variants that define one's genome are called genotypes. And the emergence biological properties that come out of this that we may want to study are called phenotypes or traits. So in terms of linking the genotypes to phenotypes, uh, for understanding human biology, a common analytic pipeline that's widely used in genetics is called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. So here, the goal is to look for genetic variants that are statistically correlated with the phenotype of interest, such as disease status. So here, I'm showing you uh, 24 different human chromosomes, shown as vertical bars, 
and places within them that have known associations with different phenotypes that are marked by different colors. So this is a very popular uh, study pipeline. Now we have more than 3,000 publications on GWAS covering 60,000 unique associations uh, across a wide range of phenotypes, including um, neurological disorders like Alzheimer's disease and very complex traits like heights. So this is all great news, but we're still yet to reach the full potential of GWAS due to the following two reasons. The first is limited statistical power. So even though we, uh, there are now data sets out there that include um, you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals' genomes, some genetic signals are either too rare or too weak to be detected with these data resources. And to be able to identify these patterns, we need even larger sample sizes to have enough statistical power. Another limitation is lack of diversity. So a lot of the data repositories out there for genomic data tend to fall within organizational or um, national boundaries, which naturally lead to study populations that are uh, relatively homogeneous in terms of ethnicity. And this li limits our understanding of uh, human genetics. So for example, there's this uh, key diabetes gene that we weren't able to find until we look at the Mexican population because the mutation that was tagging for it wasn't found in the white European population, which is the population that most of these data sets focus on. To, um, so to overcome both of these limitations, uh, we really need a way to share genomes across nations and institutions so that we can put together larger and more diverse genomic data sets. And this leads us to important uh, privacy concerns. So not only do we not fully understand the full extent of information that can be inferred from one's genome, because one's genetic material is largely fixed at birth, uh, once the state's data gets leaked, it's leaked for good. In recent years, there's been a lot of studies that show different ways of extracting sensitive information from genomic data, and this uh, makes these concerns more severe. So our proposal was to use MPC to allow researchers to analyze genomic data to, and to run GWAS studies without giving direct access to anyone uh, for these uh, sensitive genomic data sets. Since we're all experts on MPC, I don't need to describe how this actually works, but let me just mention that we um, adopt an MPC setting that's a fairly standard in the field now, um, and especially one that's based on additive sticker sharing, we use server-aided pre-processing model where we introduce a trusted dealer that generates correlated randomness. We also use fixed point arithmetic subroutines uh, since we need to be able to handle fractional numbers uh, in our statistical analyses. And our initial protocol is based on semi-honest security, but uh, you can imagine extending this to achieve active security uh, using many of the techniques that previous speakers have spoken about in this workshop. So the idea to apply NPC to this GWAS problem has been around, but the key bottleneck for practical adoption has been that of scalability. And uh, the main step in GWAS that poses a real problem is this step called population stratification collection. And here's the basic idea for it. So in GWAS, we're looking for correlations between genotypes and disease. And hopefully the, the findings that we get are linked to true risk factors that tell us something biological meaningful about the disease uh, that can help us with uh, drug development eventually. But there are other information sources that influence how genotype distributions are generated, uh, such as ancestry patterns. So it might turn out that when we run the GWAS analysis, we'll get super, uh, spurious findings that are linked to ancestry differences in the study population that actually uh, has nothing to do with the disease. So a common way to account for this confounding factor in the analysis is to use something like principal component analysis or PCA on the genotype data to extract uh, high level data patterns um, in the genotype matrix. And these are, uh, to, it, it is believed that these high level patterns capture ancestry patterns in the data set. And these are used as additional covariates in the statistical analysis. So unfortunately, PCA is a type of low ranked matrix factorization uh, algorithm that requires uh, repeated multiplication over a large input matrix and implementing this in existing NPC frameworks does not lead to a practical solution. So our main contribution in this work was to figure out how to design this protocol in a way uh, that allows us to achieve full scale 
secure GWAS with practical uh, performance. So one key idea that we use that is worth a mention is that we generalize beaver triples. So here's the conventional setup in the PC where we have a setup input, given as sticker shares, we want to compute some uh, type of arithmetic circuit over these using MPC subroutines. And in the conventional technique, what we would do is for each of these multiplication gates, we would generate a multiplication triple, right? So if you have a lot of these multiplication gates in the circuit that we want to compute, then the amount of random data that we generate and communicate uh, grows very large quickly. So what we did instead in our work was to take a more high level approach and look at larger sections of the circuit at a time and to push the randomness to the input and the output so that instead of having three random numbers per gate, we generate one random number per input and generate one and possibly a few more depending on the degree of the circuit for each output so that overall, the amount of random data depends on the input and output sizes and not the number of multiplication gates. So this, it, it turns out that this technique actually uh, leads to more efficient secure computation building blocks for our purposes for the uh, GWAS pipeline. So we use this to build uh, better protocols for exponentiation, power iteration, which is a key step in the PCA algorithm and so on. We also leverage a couple of other techniques for scalability. Uh, one of them is randomized linear algebra for the PCA uh, part of the, of the protocol. So here the, the idea is instead of applying PCA to the original genotype matrix, which is very large, uh, you can think million by million matrix, instead of doing that, we've reduced it down to a random subspace and apply PCA there and use that as an approximate solution to the original problem. So this reduces the complexity of the circuit by a lot. We also use shared pseudorandom number generators between pairs of parties in the protocol. Um, I believe one of the speakers mentioned this technique as well last week. So here the idea is that uh, in, in many places in our protocol there, uh, we often have one party that's sampling a lot of random numbers and transfer that over to a different party. So instead of doing that, we can just have them share a common seed for the PRG and have them independently sample from the same random stream. So this way we can actually reduce the communication complexity by one. So here's the overview of our secure GWAS protocol. So we start with a set of study participants who bring their own private genotype and phenotype data. And these private data sets will be first secret shared with a set of computing parties. So we envision these to be academic labs or consortia who run these protocols. Um, and these computing parties will uh, execute the MPC protocol for running GWAS study, which includes all the standard steps of GWAS that I mentioned. And at the end, the results are combined to reveal the secret and the final GWAS results are published. And as I mentioned, uh, we're using a server aided model. So we need a third party, uh, the trusted dealer who generates these beaver triples and distributes them to the computing parties. So we evaluated this pipeline on real GWAS, GWAS data sets of lung cancer, bladder cancer, and age-related macular degeneration, which is a type of eye disease. So this covers um, a range of different data set sizes from 9,000 to 23,000 individuals. And what I'm showing you here are the final GWAS results, which is basically, uh, so it's, it's shown as p-value. It, it's basically measuring the strength of correlation of each genetic variant with the disease. And we're comparing the number that's calculated by the MPC protocol with the ground truth based on the plain text data. And as you can see across the board, our protocol generates output that is highly accurate. And if you actually look into the top uh, associations that we find for each of these data sets, they also accurately match the ground truth. And I want to highlight that our top two hits for the lung cancer data set, uh, these two genes, TURD and VTI1A, these actually turn out to be the exact two same uh, top hits that the original publication reported as novel findings. And these are well-established lung cancer genes at this point. Uh, so what this is telling us is that it is actually possible to obtain these biologically meaningful results without giving anyone direct access to the raw genotypes and phenotypes. And it's also important that we're able to achieve this uh, within a reasonable runtime. So here I'm showing you the runtime and the communication bandwidth of the protocol. 
uh, over a range of different data set sizes. We simulated up to 100,000 individuals based on uh, super sampling the, the benchmark data sets we had. Um, the, the different color lines are for different phases of the protocol and the black line is for the total uh, number. So the key takeaways is that overall, both of these metrics depend linearly on the number of individuals. On all three of our benchmark data sets, our runtime is within a couple of days. And if you extrapolate these numbers to a very large number, say a million individual GWAS, the, the runtime that we get based on this figure is around two months. But we were recently able to get this down to two weeks of runtime for 1 million individuals, uh, which we think is uh, well within the practical realm, especially considering that a lot of these uh, researchers wait, currently need to wait months just to get access to these data sets. So uh, in the second half of this talk, I want to switch gears a little bit and tell you about how we could leverage these MPC techniques for a problem in a different biomedical domain, uh, namely pharmacological machine learning. So drug discovery, as you may know, is a very expensive procedure that takes years of research and a lot of resources. And faced with declining productivity in recent years, big pharma companies are now exploring a more collaborative approach to drug discovery, where they try to pull together their data, knowledge, and resources to find new drug candidates together. However, existing partnerships for collaboration are largely limited in scope due to conflicting financial interests, including those related to intellectual property claims. So this is a key barrier to data sharing in this domain. A key step in the drug discovery pipeline is to predict novel drug target interactions or DTIs. So given a set of interactions that we know already between uh, chemical compounds and protein targets, we may want to ask whether a given compound uh, could be repurposed to target a different protein for a different disease or whether an entirely new compound shows any bioactivity for protein targets of interest. Now this interaction space is very large given millions of, inter uh, millions of compounds and tens of thousands of proteins. So exhaustively characterizing these interactions using experiments is infeasible. So commonly people adopt computational models that uh, leverage known set of interactions. And uh, so the train on these uh, observed interactions and prioritize unknown interactions to follow up in lab experiments. So if we had a platform where we could pull together these data across multiple parties, then we can hope to put together larger training data uh, and, and increase the accuracy in these computational models. But there are data privacy concerns associated with that. So there could be interactions that are financially valuable that the companies may not be willing to share with others, or they might be working with entirely new chemical compounds that they cannot reveal without any legal protection. So simply asking everyone to share the data is not a viable approach to collaboration. So in this work, we propose to use MPC to uh, tackle this problem where we allow multiple collaborating entities with their own list of privately observed ETIs uh, to pull their data securely and run an MPC protocol together to train predictive machine learning models and obtain predictions from them and, and these trained models and the obtained interaction, uh, the predicted interactions are distributed back with the collaborating entities as a reward for participation in this protocol. So the MPC setup is the same as what we use for the GWAS uh, uh, work. But here, the difference is that now we're running um, gradient descent training process for NL models instead of computing a statistical quantity as in GWAS. So since we're secret sharing the entire data, we're hiding not just the interaction patterns, but also the identities of the drug compounds and also the protein targets as well. So how is DTI prediction normally done in plain text? So there are two main branches of methods in the literature. So one is based on matrix factorization, where a set of known interactions between drugs and targets are represented as a matrix, a sparse matrix. And some form of low rank matrix factorization is applied to this matrix to find a structure within this matrix to try to fill in the missing entries. A different branch of methods uh, view this matrix as a graph instead and apply graph algorithms like network diffusion or random walk process 
we try to propagate information over this graph structure so, uh, so that we can predict missing edges in this graph. So if you were to take these state-of-the-art plain text methods and implement them in MPC, we actually end up getting something that's not really uh, practical. And this is mainly due to the fact that these algorithms depend quadratically on the size of the data set, uh, that is the number of drugs and the targets. And uh, doing that in MPC is just not uh, feasible given millions of drugs that we might get through collaboration. So in our work, we had to turn to a, an entirely different approach, uh, especially one that's based on a neural network. So we start by summarizing the chemical and structural properties of these drugs and proteins um, as a feature vector. For the chemical compound, we use what's known as structural fingerprint or ECFP. So this is a standard way of summarizing a chemical structure. For protein targets, we use the protein domain profile from the PFAM database, which is uh, basically a set of known functional domains within a protein uh, that we use as a, as a feature vector. So given this, we feed this through a neural network model to try to predict whether a given pair of chemical compound and protein interacts or not. And we introduce some design uh, decisions to make this more amenable for efficient MPC, uh, like the choice of nonlinear activation, activation function of this neural network, as well as the loss function. So both of these components uh, will look something like uh, what's, what's shown on the slide. So it requires, it's a piecewise, uh, function of uh, two segments, and it requires only a single secure comparison to compute. So the idea is to take this model and train it on a uh, secret share interaction data, data set using NPC, using a standard gradient descent process. And the reason why this is more scalable than the plain text methods that I described in the previous slide is that now we're taking linear passes over the training data as opposed to something that depends quadratically on the number of uh, compounds in the data set. So we took this NPC protocol and evaluated them on uh, DTI benchmark data sets. So drug bank is a very popular one that's used by DTI prediction uh, uh, literature. So this one contains 2000 interactions. So it's quite small, but um, this one is highly curated. So all these interactions are high confidence ones. We also use a much larger data, data set called Stitch which includes 1.5 million interactions covering half a million chemical compounds. Um, this one includes functional interactions in addition to physical interactions. So there's more noise in the data set, uh, but the sheer size of it allowed us to test the scalability of our pipeline. So here are some cross-validation results where we hold out uh, a subset of the data for testing uh, a model that's trained on the rest of the data in a repeated manner. So on the drug bank data set, we are actually able to achieve a competitive accuracy that's even slightly better than the state-of-the-art DTI net method. And uh, the key thing to note here is that our protocol never sees the, the raw data, right? And all these baseline methods are actually run using plain text data. On the much larger stitch data set, we actually noticed that a lot of these baseline methods could not actually scale um, to this data because of their quadratic memory requirement. So we could only compare to uh, relatively simple matrix factorization based uh, methods. And in this setting, we were actually able to achieve, obtain a fairly large improvement in prediction accuracy using our uh, training process. And again, this is with the additional guarantee of data privacy. So these models are obtained within a reasonable runtime uh, which is uh, reassuring. So here I'm showing you the runtime per epoch, which is a single training pass through the data set as a function of data set size, so number of interactions. So even for data sets, including millions of interactions, our training time is within a couple of days. And all of the results that I showed you uh, are based on a model that was trained after 1.5 uh, epochs, so still within a few days. So we wanted to go beyond cross-validation and to actually demonstrate that one can use this type of NPC pipeline to obtain a model that can get novel findings. So here, what we did was we trained the model on the entire Stitch data set, uh, basically uh, pretending that this data set was pulled together from multiple sources and we're, ne uh, we're never giving anyone uh, direct access to the data set. 
And uh, we prioritize unknown interactions. And here I'm showing you the top predictions based on two versions of our model uh, that have to do with different ways of sampling the negative examples. So in both cases, many of our top predictions uh, were validated using literature evidence or also by our own lab experiments. So the ones that have asterisk next to them are the ones that we were able to test in a lab setting. So just to point out a few cool examples, the, uh, the top prediction in both cases between droloxifene and estrogen receptor alpha and beta, uh, these are actually well-established interactions that reached clinical trial phase three, but were later dropped because the company was able to find an even more effective drug for the same targets. But this is a real interaction that was somehow omitted from the data set. We have a similar story for serocalcitol and vitamin D receptor. This is also a real interaction that went to clinical trial but were, uh, was later dropped. Perhaps more interestingly, we were also able to find a, an entirely novel interaction between uh, this drug called imatinib and protein called ERBB4, and we were able to validate this in a, in a lab experiment. So again, uh, similar to the GWAS setting here, we're able to see that uh, using NPC protocols, we can obtain these results that are uh, biologically meaningful uh, without giving anyone direct access to it. So just to quickly summarize, I hope I convinced you that we now have all the tools needed to build these practical NPC protocols for key biomedical research workflows for certain uh, tasks. And I showed you two examples of this. Um, one key observation we had is that at least currently black box application of NPC frameworks is often insufficient. Um, so right now it is very important to come up with NPC friendly algorithms and protocol uh, design to achieve practical performance for many of these problems. I just wanted to mention that uh, we're actively working on deploying these methods in practice. So I hope you'll be able to hear an update from us in the near future. So with that, I want to thank my co-authors of the papers that I described to you today, David Wu, Brian He, and Bonnie Berger. I also acknowledge my uh, colleagues at the Brit Institute with whom I'm working, uh, continuing to work on these directions. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Ying Hun. That was a great talk. Uh, so there aren't any questions right now. I just wanna say I'm very excited to hear about the upcoming deployment of this. <clears throat> okay, so if there's no questions, then if anyone has more questions about the talks from today or other talks, uh, put them in the Zulip chat platform. Uh, okay, there's one question in chat just popped up, uh, which is which MPC platform did you use? Or, or did you code it yourself from scratch, I guess? We did code it ourselves from scratch. It wasn't too bad, although we did uh, implement a lot of the basic building block protocols uh, like you know, comparison and division, things like that based on the literature, but it is a new mm -hmm. uh, library. It is publicly available. You can find the link in our papers. Okay, nice. Um, actually, I guess I have a related question. So um, maybe specifically for this upcoming deployment, do you think people view semi-honest security as enough for these types of medical applications or would they really like to have something malicious if possible? I think, the current thinking is that the scalability concern is big enough that uh, you know, like the more we can trim down the runtime, the better. So that's why we started with some honest security. But I, I can definitely see the option for malicious security being, um, being appealing to practitioners. So I'm currently mm -hmm. thinking about doing that as well. Yeah. OK, great. Well, thanks again. And thanks again to all the speakers from today. Um, we will be back tomorrow. Goodbye, everyone.